So uh, thank you so much for uh, joining with us to uh, both the uh, dignitaries that we have on uh, Planogram and Practical uh, Cities Initiative today. So uh, before I begin uh, with the panel discussion, I would like to uh, tell all that, uh, who, have, who have joined us with today that uh, today's session is dedicated to all the frontline health, health workers scientists of Indian community as uh, today India historic uh, historically commenced with the uh, world's largest vaccination program against the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, today's session is dedicated to all the frontline health workers and scientists of all the uh, nations across the globe. Uh, also, the uh, introduction to Planogram is a ritual in every session that we conduct. So basically, Planogram is a by the students for the students initiative, which is aimed at uh, connecting top notch academicians, policymakers and bureaucrats with the students of urban planning, architecture and urban design domain. Till date, we uh, have been able to conduct around 25 plus student act, uh, student centric activities, which have led us to uh, connect uh, 3000 plus students across 25 plus countries. And uh, it, it is our uh, sheer fortune that we have been receiving a lot of appreciation as well as a lot of love from the student community as well as the that we host. Uh, and uh, this session with the Practical Cities initi Initiative, um, we have request Mr. Jai Shah from Practical Initiatives. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Piyush. Are you able to hear me? Yes, but we cannot see you, Mr. Jai. Uh, I have turned my video on, but uh, someone needs to allow me to that. So, okay, yeah. Is it visible now, or it's not? But yes, you can go on. Yeah. Yes, I think I can go. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Piyush, for uh, this wonderful introduction, and thank you, uh, Dr. Saras uh, Prataswami and Sunit Mohinder sir, for uh, coming today on this panel discussion on landscape design and sustainable economy. So uh, according to me, for a city uh, to grow, you require engineers. Uh, it's, it's not only that you require engineers. You require engineers, you require planners, you require officers, you require architects, you require lots of people. And then it's a collaborative of everyone. And then a city can grow and develop. So Practical Cities is an initiative by a group of young urban enthusiasts uh, who are aiming to have conversations around urban realm. It's not only for planning, it's not only for ag, it's for everyone uh, who thinks uh, they can contribute to a city. So we conduct online series of masterclasses and we learn from grassroots level urban practitioners who have implemented something on ground. And we learn from their various success and failure stories, various best practices and case studies through these masterclasses. Okay, so uh, our basic tar target audience is young professionals and uh, uh, the students who are working in urban domain. So with, without wasting much time, sir, uh, we would really like to hear from you, uh, Sunit sir and Sarah Prataswami uh, ma'am. Uh, I would like Piyush to maybe start uh, this wonderful yes. discussion. Yes, thank you so much uh, for introductory remarks, Mr. Jai, and uh, you are doing very great job uh, with the Practical Cities Initiative. It is indeed a fortune for us to collaborate with uh, young minds like you. Uh, so uh, before, uh, without wasting much of time, I would like to state our theme for today's uh, panel discussion. The theme for panel discussion is the landscape design and sustainable uh, ecology. So uh, basically, as Mr. Jai correctly mentioned that uh, for a city to grow, I would like to take it to society for a uh, for a society to so what kind of practitioners along with the citizens themselves and uh, planogram with uh, that particular thing in mind has been organizing various uh, discussions and uh, various uh, uh, sessions with thought leaders who work in different different vibrant domains so today we have uh, two experts I know uh, Mr. Sunit will have an objection to the word expert, but still, <laughs> I would like to say experts. Uh, today, we have two experts from landscape domain who are not just limited to landscape domain, of course, to have a discussion and to put their uh, uh, views on the respective topics that they have. Now, uh, may I please request uh, Professor, Do uh, Professor Dr. Sara Pratasoni to uh, begin with her topic. And her topic of presentation is Italian approach towards landscape design and sustainable ecology. 
I would like to introduce Sara Ma'am in a short. In short, that Sara Ma'am is an extensive researcher, an experienced landscape architect, and who heads the MSc in Architecture and Landscape Design program at the Politecnico di Milano, Italy. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Sara Ma'am to kindly begin? I hand over the virtual dais to you. Yeah. Uh, first, I I would like to thank uh, Piyush and all the organization for this invitation. That was. Very nice for me, very interesting. As you know, I'm responsible for a program where we have a lot of international students and somehow uh, it's important to, to keep this international level of connection uh, with uh, the, de the debate and the reflection in the fields of uh, teaching and research of our school. Uh, I prepared a, a short presentation. Now I will share my screen. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, it is visible. OK, I was uh, somehow asked to do a lot of uh, work <laughs> for this conference is that I did very. I was very happy to do. I hope I will keep uh, precisely the time which was assigned because I would like to give you the idea of uh, the statues of art uh, in uh, the reflection in Italy about the question which is in the center of this Congress and in a way give at the same time also an idea about the context of our research, what it is happening in the real world, which is running our university and in generally the reflection of Italy. The first image is going to help me. Italy, as you know, is somehow connected to a lot of stereotypical images which are bringing around in the world a kind of touristic image of a beautiful landscape with a bucolic uh, dimension. Uh, the real situation is, uh, of course, uh, uh, much more complex. We have also this level, for sure. We had uh, probably, uh, until 50 years ago, <coughs> a very beautiful landscape. Today, there are a lot of questions, and somehow also university and uh, uh, landscape architecture is really uh, solicited to reflect about the main questions that we have. These two images are from a famous photographer, Toscany landscape on one side, Venice, which is again a, a very stereotypical, conventional, beautiful landscape. But as you see, the same photographer is now portraying the big ships that are invading the public space and the heritage of such a beautiful and fragile context like Venice. <coughs> but uh, the situation in Italy should be understood also further. These are four images very quickly, of course, the environmental crisis that we know working all over the world is impacting in a very strong way also in Italy for different reasons, for the geological, geomorphological structure, for the uh, long period of policies which we are not really able to handle and to prevent uh, the risk, and also for sure for the fact that we have a very ancient uh, uh, heritage that uh, of course uh, is interfering with the big risk. We see air pollution, uh, landslides, uh, uh, water uh, risk. And all these things are somehow suggesting to landscape architecture to move a little bit uh, the point of view for the work. Because uh, as you know, that in the traditional way, we have such a strong uh, heritage already beginning from the medieval and Renaissance time with a, also a strong tradition of working about landscape in this field that was somehow developed in a uh, way of dealing with the question of landscape from the viewpoint of uh, garden design. Today, of course, uh, we are also hesitated to open the field to uh, to include the questions that are referred to, for example, the SDGs questions, and in general to the question of sustainable development. I don't say too many words about this. I assume that uh, uh, you know very well about this question. In Italy, we have, together with the question I have showed before, also really a very strong question about uh, territorial inequalities, new forms of poor poverty and disadvantage. And right now, with the pandemic, it's coming even more evident the fact uh, that we have a problem of what we could define, and in the debate it is defined with this word, spatial justice. Not all the people all over the country can somehow afford to 
have uh, quality of the environment and, and uh, uh, landscape uh, in the proper way. The main question that probably characterized the contemporary level of reflection about sustainability in Italy, it's probably what I wrote here, which is a question that was developed on the theoretical level by interesting theoretician in USA, I, I think, for example, about Elizabeth Mayer, which, who wrote even a manifest about this. In Italy, we have to deal with this question because of the conditions that we uh, live with. On one side, a very strong and powerful uh, uh, traditional landscape with a natural beauty and also cultural, very interesting uh, heritage. On the other side, the question of sustainability, which is somehow uh, manifesting itself on the three levels that we know are associated to the question of uh, sustainability. There are some basic questions that are somehow characterizing the work in Italy about landscape. The first question for sure is the question of palimpsest. Again, I take a word from the debate. You know probably about this. Of course, it's clear in a country which has a, such a long time, long lasting heritage that each place, it is the result of a lot of transformations, both because of the natural processes, but also because of a cultural and a, a technological transformation. So about each time we work about landscape, this is something that has to be understood, described. And the question of the relation between space and time is characterizing in a very strong way the work about landscape. Second question is, of course, the question of the idea of nature. I'm teaching to, in an international course, it's very clear that not over, all over the world we have the same ideas about this. The Italian idea about the relation between nature and artificial realm, it's characterized by uh, the uh, humanistic uh, prototype. The image that we see on the top of these three images representing this idea. You have on one side the city, which is the place where all the good things happen. On the other side, you have what it is outside, the landscape, which is countryside and also wilderness, in between a wall. In the traditional way, somehow we were used to have a very organized and hierarchical relation. The countryside was working for producing the goods for the city. The city was taking care of the countryside. The city was looking towards the landscape uh, from the, the city walls. And somehow the idea of space was uh, an idea that is very well represented from the image of the ideal city. It is a city where stone is prevailing, where nature has to find very precise and organized places, the gardens and the park. And somehow the idea was a progression of natural dimension where in the humanistic approach, you have the first nature wilderness, the second nature, which is a cultivating and transformed uh, nature, which is useful and necessary for the survival of human beings in the world. And the third nature, which was uh, somehow feeding a long tradition of work about landscape, where nature and culture join to develop beautiful places. This was the original dimension. This is a humanistic perspective, which is you can read in a lot of different essays, which is still working very strong in the, in the conventional way people, common people is thinking about the landscape. Of course, the situation now is different also in our country. Somehow this edge, the city wall, which is a symbolic edge, is moving. Somehow we are going to understand that each living being is connecting to the other in a very complex system of relation and no one is can be uh, living in a qualified situation, can well-being is always depending from a, a kind of coherent relation between all the different living entities, that, which are human beings, but are also vegetation, are even animals, and the perspective is somehow, somehow putting a little bit in discussion the centrality of the human dominion on nature and the centrality of city on landscape. So now we move in a different perspective, which is very much related to the notion which was brought in the center of the debate, not by an Italian, but uh, by a French uh, researcher and uh, 
uh, landscape architect, Sergei Kerman, the idea that somehow what it is in between things is so articulated and complex that this should be in the center of the uh, attention of landscape architecture because it is a kind of unde undetermined uh, uh, area where a lot of potential could be developed also in providing the satisfaction of some main goals that now we understand are very important, as you know about biodiversity and uh, in general uh, a relation with the natural aspects, which is more careful in not in establishing a strong domination, but respecting the possibility of uh, protecting environment for the human life. There are a lot of publications uh, which are somehow in this, I have to say, Italy is somehow in depth uh, with other cultures. On one side, the French culture, Gilles Clément, and in general, the landscape school of Versailles. But on the other side, also, it is in depth uh, uh, with the American culture, James Corner, and all the debate about uh, 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 landscape urbanism, which was introduced in uh, the reflection starting from the beginning of this new millennium uh, by the American culture. But about this, I go quite further. I think uh, uh, now it is the time to make a little bit the point about in which way the Italian landscape design culture is dealing with the main questions that are part of the, the reflection and of the practical experience about the topic of uh, uh, today's discussion. In uh, preparing my uh, contribution, I decided to show always somehow the deep-rooted uh, experience of uh, design experience, which is somehow related to a long tradition, but also developing a contemporary production very often in an open and very intense intersection with international debate, which is somehow producing some interesting results also in Italy. Uh, the first, uh, of course, the first main question, of course, that uh, in Italy, like in other countries, we have to deal with, it is about the fact that landscape architecture with with its approach, which is a kind of multi-scholar and also multidisciplinary approach, can in a very positive way contribute in big processes where the question of environmental restoration is uh, uh, contributing uh, in improving the quality of life and uh, in introducing a new sustainable way of uh, establishing a, a relation between uh, industrial production and uh, the way we live in our country. Uh, it is quite curious what I show you because I, I found a, a proposal by one of the main landscape architects of the post-war Second World War period, Pietro Porcinai, uh, about uh, how to somehow recover, recover the site of uh, a very important steel factory in uh, the south of Italy, Ital Cedar in Taranto. This is really a huge crisis for part of a big city with a lot of uh, problems in terms of environmental pollution, but also as public health. Uh, a strong questions with a lot of also economical implications, social and economical implications. In the 70s, Pietro Porcinai was invited to deal with the question of this relation. And you see that still in the 70s, the approach was uh, an approach where the idea was to use uh, green materials to solve more or less just a, a, a aesthetical question. So in a way, the relation between sustainability and aesthetics in landscape was not yet uh, discussed in a very precise way. It is, it is a very well done proposal. It is also interesting, but it is not somehow matching really the question. Uh, later on, the situation probably a little bit improved, uh, but the multidisciplinary approach is still far to be reached in the Italian current production, I have to admit. Uh, we have some interesting experiences. I show you one which is actually not from an Italian architect. It is an Italian process uh, uh, elaborated on the base of a German designer proposal. It is in Turin. Turin, as you know, is uh, one of the main industrial cities with a very 
this peculiar environmental situation because of the presence of the mountains very close and a very strong pollution because the heavy industry is producing a lot of pollution. The, the image on the left corner is showing the previous situation. Uh, then, uh, in the economical post-industrial abandonment of a lot of plants, uh, Turin is a city which is dealing with a big problem of what to do with this kind of abandoned and contaminated sites. This is one of the most interesting proposals, where somehow the site is given back uh, to a public use with the introduction of an interesting program of new function, the memory of the industrial present is kept. The main question of uh, remediation are somehow solved, and uh, the solution is uh, emblematic of a new approach, which is this time really multidisciplinary, where the right competencies are involved under the coordination of the landscape designer, which is not just paying attention to the question of beauty, but it is also paying a lot of attention to the dimension of uh, really the quality and environmental quality together with, of course, also the qualification of the environment. Second big question in Italy, of course, we have to deal with. Italy is one of the countries in Europe which, with a, one of the strongest problem about hydrogeological risk. We don't have big rivers, but we have really a lot of small river, not really uh, stable in, in the amount of water, which are provoking a lot of uh, um, strong crisis. Somehow we have a, an incredibly long tradition of uh, technological uh, um, development in dealing with the question of water management. Here I show you a beautiful a miracle. It's a miracle city, which is Mantua. If you come to Italy, I suggest really to visit it. Already in the uh, 12th century, uh, somehow they uh, used uh, the water of a river to realize a huge defense work together with the city walls, and they organized really important hydraulic uh, uh, infrastructures uh, with uh, the production of three different lakes and uh, lakes at different levels, and with the realization of something that we still see as a, really a beautiful. Um, situation which is dealing with the question of the water management of the Mincho River. In the, this tradition, now again, unfortunately, the studio is a studio land which is based in Italy, but the founder is again a German <laughs> landscape architect, is dealing more or less with the same question. Uh, one of the main questions is to work in the everyday landscape to solve the prevention of uh, hydro, the hydro, uh, hydraulic risk. And this is somehow the proposal where landscape architecture is dealing with this kind of uh, strong main question. Third big question is, of course, the question of designing infrastructure and landscape. Somehow Italy, as you know, is a very difficult country because it's a, a very long peninsula. In the middle, you have a really huge chain of mountain. In the 50s, it was decided to realize a big uh, highway which was connecting the, uh, the opposite points of the city, which was really the crucial decision to start modernization all over the country, north and south, in the attempt also to solve uh, this kind of uh, territorial inequalities situation that I was mentioning at the, before, at the beginning. It was basically an engineering work where no architect, not too many architects were involved, and also not for sure not landscape architects, was solved on a very technical level, but uh, it's still uh, uh, impressive to see the relation between this big, huge infrastructure and uh, the landscape in a work which was uh, realized in eight years, from 1956 uh, until 1964. Again, Pietro Porcinai was involved later on in some other um, work about uh, the quality of the landscape of the infrastructure. In this case, basically, the idea was really to produce uh, a, a more organized and uh, well well organized and also impressive image for for the highway but again according to me 
we are still missing a little bit the question that landscape architecture should assume also the role of coordinating the multidisciplinary contribution to solve the big, big question. Another important question that I would like to emphasize today it is uh, the fact that traditionally Italy was uh, a, a kind of a country where agriculture was uh, one of the main activities. Uh, it was an activity which was studied and was developed, of course, in the century with specific techniques. And of course, the techniques for cultivating were producing the landscapes that now we perceive as beautiful places, but uh, don't belong to the natural realm, but because they are the result of a continuative and well-organized technical approach to the question of agriculture. On the left corner, I quote a book of the, which was published in 1961, which was somehow summarizing all this process, which is very important. Also about this, uh, just to mention one of the most important Italian architects in the international debate, a lot of new activities are somehow brought ahead in terms of defining a new enhancement of also the agricultural productive landscape. Uh, this is uh, the uh, realization of a um, winery uh, in uh, Rocca di Frassinello, uh, where the work of the architect is dealing with this really difficult question and about fra the fragile dimension of a uh, uh, agricultural landscape and the wine production site in relation to the natural context. Uh, another important question, which is also characterizing very much the image of Italian landscape and the image of the urban landscape in Italy, it is a question of designing public space. Uh, there, of course, we have uh, a very uh, um, uh, heavy and important heritage here I just quote two which are somehow paradigms of uh, what it is public space in the contemporary city. On one side, the famous Piazza del Campo di Siena, which is a, a, an incredible public space, which originally was organized for making market, but was already able to be, in a way, what we mean now for a multidisciplinary approach because was providing a surface, was providing water management, was providing comfort, and was providing a place which could be used for different functions. Uh, each year, as you probably know, in this field, they do even a competition of horses. And so somehow it is a paradigm of the potential of public space to answer to different questions. And it is a paradigm also for the contemporary dimension of public space, which is introducing completely new behaviors and also questions and introducing new things. The other example is more a formal example is Pisa. You have really the idea of a green plateau, which is hosting monumental, incredibly impressive building, which is again a paradigm for the contemporary city of skyscrapers of the global metropolis that we see all over the world, whereas this green surface is somehow the minimum cap that can be done and the idea of the economy of the means to gain a, really a strong quality is somehow teaching us a lot of things in a lot of aspects. The contemporary work in Italy about uh, the question of uh, public space is of course uh, uh, very rich and very interesting. I decided here to bring the example of the work of a master for us uh, of the contemporary architecture is uh, uh, Franco Zagari who was dealing with the requalification and the implementation of a public system in one city, a very problematic city in the south of Italy with a proposal that it's quite interesting. Finally, the last topic I would like to bring to the attention, it's a question of parks and gardens. Here I summarize somehow what I was saying before. Uh, I almost at the end, <laughs> I try to keep the, the schedule. Uh, somehow it is a, a, a collection of the representation of the um, humanistic idea of the relation between architecture and nature in the form of the so-called third landscape. And all these representations are very clearly defining a dominion where the uh, design of garden is defining places for leisure, for pleasure, and on 
somehow in relation to the idea of a countryside or of the wilderness, which is outside the garden, which is also somehow the background that provides a meaning to this idea of the, of the garden in relation to architecture. Of course, in the contemporary experience, this dimension is still working in a strong way because there is a, still a, a big uh, demand of uh, places of this quality. I brought you one of the most recent proposal uh, in Milan, in the area of so-called Porta Nuova, where the big skyscraper were realized, and where again, uh, and this is something we could reflect about an international um, studio of, of landscape architecture, uh, the leader is uh, Petra Bless, proposed to organize the ground in between the skyscraper, which, as you know, is always a big question because the scale of the relation between the skyscraper and the relation between the human scale and the gigantic scale of the building is it's not easy to, to deal with in, in the landscape design. Here, Petra Bless proposed to make what it is called the library of the trees, with the idea of evoking here the importance of natural elements, the trees within the urban and the more artificial and mineral context, uh, with a design which has a, a very strong success in terms of uh, public presence and public use, but also with a character which is in a way a very geometric and over-designed solution related, of course, to the idea of a city, Milano, which is now competing on the level of the big metropolis in the globalization processes. To finish, all these topics we have to dealt with are somehow at the center of the teaching in the master program I'm leading in Polytechnic Community Milano in the Piacenza campus, which is, um, I, I bring you very, very few information. It is a, a very important uh, international uh, master program. We have uh, uh, each year more or less 120 students uh, apply, uh, not applying, uh, <laughs> enrolling, and uh, uh, 100 of them are coming all over the world. The biggest uh, Groups are from uh, China, Iran, India, but then from also a, lo a lot of other countries. A lot of my students are probably listening now uh, to us. In the uh, program, somehow we try to keep together the question of the relation between architecture, sustainable architecture, so the responsibility of the technical infrastructure in work about some main topics from going from housing, big services, and also infrastructure, together with a very strong attention about the contemporary debate on the question of landscape debate and some of sustainability is the main word which is uh, uh, interfering with the idea that we have really to develop the tools for preparing young architects because finally our students are graduates as architects according to the European rules. Uh, so anyway, we, the responsibility it is to educate young architects able to be part of big processes uh, where the different uh, uh, competencies find a new way of uh, intersection and to deal for, for solving at the highest level possible level of competencies, the big question of the contemporary city. Uh, it is international because of the student, also because of the professors, and we try also to uh, keep, uh, even in, in uh, the last year with a pandemic, big difficult situation that we had in Italy, we try to keep a, a strong uh, uh, activity of uh, uh, summer school workshops uh, with the idea of a, uh, experiencing the didactic, which is uh, always keeping together uh, the practical activity in fields uh, with a lot of work also with models and other uh, very tactile of the production object, but also with a, a high theoretical um, reflection. And uh, I think now I have to close because I, otherwise I, I occupy too much time. Uh, of course, uh, I wrote here uh, some possible contacts for people who are 
uh, going are interesting in having more information. And uh, I thank you again for this opportunity. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sara, for Sarah, such extensive and uh, comprehensive. Uh, and it is really great to get to touch that's almost all the aspects. I don't know if I don't know. So uh, basically, uh, it is really great to see that touch all the aspects of uh, uh, the landscape. The, uh, the agriculture, heritage, and uh, and uh, the public uh, It is. I think I'm having a eco anyway, but it is really great to have all the aspects touched in such a crispy manner and still uh, being able to deliver all the uh, content that we want. And of course, uh, the moment you talked about Turin, uh, Turin is definitely uh, known to Indians because of the famous football club that is Juventus. <laughs> from Turin and uh, the famous Cristiano Ronaldo that plays there. So it's definitely nice to see the other side of Turin where the industrialization is also there. So maybe that is a great takeaway for all the football fans here <laughs> uh, in our uh, session. Well, I have a few doubts in my mind, but I'm going to hold on as uh, they are going to formulate our uh, question and answer session. But it's time for an also uh, like an interesting and exciting topic from uh, Professor Sunit Mohindru now, who is going to present the landscape architecture in India, manifestations, manifestations and narratives, where he'll be uh, delivering uh, his views about not just the sustainable ecology, but also about the science and culture from an Indian perspective. So without wasting much of time, I invite uh, Mr. Sunit Mohindru, who is founder and principal at the Oracles, as well as he happens to be the visiting professor for at uh, various national institutes, so I hand over the virtual dice to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Piyush, uh, and uh, many congratulations to Sara for uh, such a wonderful presentation and uh, insights into the issues that uh, are um, are hovering around our minds as landscape architects, and that was a. a crisp amalgamation of all those issues into a short presentation. I'll uh, now share my screen. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Yes, it is visible, sir. Okay. Is it full screen or no? Uh, not yet, sir. So I think uh, this is also good. Because uh, in the full screen mode, uh, the slides get dragged. Uh, okay. There's a lag, so I. This is also perfect. Yeah. Uh, is it there now? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what I wanted to speak about today was uh, what impacts are, uh, what runs behind our minds when we uh, get landscape architecture in education as well as practice. And uh, one of the things that I, because uh, we were particularly talking about the Indian narrative, one of the things that I wanted to really begin with is to say that uh, India has been a repository of foremost natural and cultural diversity and also uh, has stood up as an icon of uh, very rooted and embedded thinking in various spheres of uh, human existence. So uh, we as landscape architects, really need to uh, understand that invocation and reinterpretation of these physical assets and intangible attributes is very important for our practice because herein lies the future of meaningful, relevant and sustainable landscape engagement. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, uh, really touch upon right in the beginning was that uh, because uh, we as landscape architects are always struggling against various issues and factors. But uh, 
as I quote Dr. Ikeda, who is a, a, a Buddhist scholar and uh, has been presenting uh, to the UN for towards the Sustainable Development Goals every year. So uh, he he says that the creative process is a struggle with one's own willingness to accept easy compromises, while a new path can be blazed only by overcoming that temptation and pushing oneself to the very limits, taking on challenges, making efforts and applying one's ingenuity. So uh, that's what I have kind of followed in my own uh, uh, life as, a, as an architect. And uh, here I uh, um, show you some uh, understanding of narratives that I feel uh, are uh, crucial to our, uh, to our uh, discourse in landscape. So uh, to begin with, I would like to talk about a few issues which are very, very crucial in uh, understanding landscape architecture in India and uh, in general also. So uh, I would like to talk about the attitude towards nature as one of the uh, primary points. Now here, the point that I want to make is that although we all know that landscape design is truly an opportunity and a tool to, tool to celebrate and bring in nature in a curated form within controlled peripheries of design canvases, but Indian worldview has always looked at nature itself as landscape, exploring opportunity and space within it and shifting coordinates with seasons. So it's uh, like if you've uh, looked at that poem of uh, Kalidasa called uh, Megadutam, where he explains the journey of the cloud, which traverses uh, the regional diversity of India and talks about uh, all that we see in nature and how we make that our own and find our unique place within it. So the interpretation of la this phrase, landscape space, therefore arises from identifying what is special within regional experiences that would form a palette of co-joined canvases linked through natural flows. So that was one point that I thought was very important to understand attitude towards nature, where design, cultivation, as well as nature, all the three play a very, very important role in um, constituting landscape um, architecture. The second idea uh, is the aspect of aesthetic, which is course, a very primary requirement uh, to, to look at uh, landscape, however, uh, often very confused too. So uh, landscape is an idea and this idea becomes space. Its ingenious quality truly depends on the profundity of the imagination. So I am quite perturbed with this new culture of borrowing images in transporting aesthetic. I think this is truly a bane of globalization. An original aesthetic order endowed with intangible symbolic content would enrich design thinking. This would need to derive from each context and the values that are ingrained within it. So this idea of aesthetics is not something that is borrowed, is what I'm saying, rather something that comes out of the context. This context may be the site, it, it may be the brief, it may be the philosophical uh, approach of one's mind at a particular moment in time and so on and so forth. Then we talk about ecology and sustainability, where uh, I would like to uh, again reiterate that because landscape comprises living material, it is also a repository of processes which are in constant evolution. And uh, there is a cyclic rhythm which inscribes patterns on the ground which, which are visible to the eye. So ecological appropriateness and sustainability need to be an ingrained value, an attitude and an unsaid inevitability. I would not say that one should uh, say that sustainability is one of the approaches. No, it is not an approach. It is rather an attitude. Landscape design cannot be treated as an engineering solution alone to merely resolve ecological conflict. So ecology is crucial to be ingrained as a value in anything that we call landscape. So uh, going forward, the next uh, issue is about landscape art. Here, uh, when we talk of aesthetic, naturally art is something that is the art of making. So landscape design relies on the ability to organize and structure thoughts 
and situations along with a working knowledge of earth sciences life sciences land engineering and etc now landscape aesthetic would look for inspiration in art and organization inherent in nature so that means we are talking about discerning beauty in natural flow and patterns this discernment is important ability to sense space in nature translates into process to create landscape space in design unless we are able to see space in nature unless we are able to perceive space we would not be able to create this space and that too with natural material employing land to create space know how of processes underlying phenomena related to land water plant material is the source of creating ceaseless landscape rich in art and philosophy the other aspect apart from nature is the culture that constitutes a repository of responses to space time geography technology and so on so traditions vernacular architecture cultural landscape these embody a vast array of thought what is important here is the ability to distinguish form and archetype from its motivation and cause that was the key to uh, create that kind of a landscape at at a particular time and that and herein lies the key also to perpetuate the cultural continuum between life and its environment discernment and appreciation of architecture history poetry writing performing art craft coupled with the skill and dexterity is crucial to engage in meaningful landscape design so this combination of nature culture and associations is something that is always uh, an instrument which enables us to look at landscape order when we go go to create landscape the uh, next idea i want to talk about is landscape education and uh, in that one want to speak about going an extra mile where uh, uh, of course uh, landscape education constitutes theory and studio oriented uh, subjects and there is uh, so much of uh, uh, it's because landscape in itself is uh, um, has a vast array of disciplines within its own discipline so there are arts there are sciences there is engineering now uh, a vast storehouse of data always lies in students work and in our country there is no dearth of places that have been documented time and again and uh, these include regional settings rural uh, areas urban uh, settings natural cultural designed landscape what i am wanting to uh, bring forth here is that if we could only develop a concerted method of cataloging such studies then so much value can be created out of this unlimited resource and it could feed in into nodal projects and proposals mooted by the government and public bodies so this student research is something which needs to be seriously thought of as a as a as a, as a crucial resource mm. also a good benefit could accrue out of an industry and institutional collaboration where uh, one would be able to find ways to fund these kind of documentation exercises and also funding for publication initiatives as a result lot of this work would see the light of the day and another uh, aspect to it is also public participation or societal engagement because that is where the opportunities of outreach awareness generation and building consensus lies and when we talk of the public realm then naturally the pride in projects which are uh, carried on through public participation is going to be a key to uh, um, sustain uh, these in the steam that they were started with and uh, coming now to the um, uh, last thing the landscape practice where uh, one talks about uh, again uh, one's own idea of how uh, one would like to look at landscape and how one would like to uh, amalgamate these varied issues into a practice so here uh, i just uh, thought that i would put these important uh, aspects right up front that a landscape architect determines the complexion of the project and it is completely unfair to think of oneself as just an other consultant so it is here that we need to understand that uh, we are uh, in fact uh, capable of bringing great value as design partners 
and landscape architecture firms in their present form are in, in fact fully geared to come up to the challenge of creating meaningful narratives so uh, i thought that to 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 show uh, to to showcase a bit of uh, this uh, this uh, um, dialogue between the narrative and the way it manifests we would go through certain uh, certain works of our own which talks about which really talk about the themes and how they come across as uh, images so uh, i would quickly browse through some of this so one theme is how one establishes a dialogue with the setting what is the approach of the designed landscape with its larger surrounding both visible and intangible so uh, here are uh, some pictures of uh, how we look at establishing continuum with surroundings and uh, thereby generating lines of force within designed landscape that coincide with the lines of force of the natural landscape and herein lies a tapestry of uh, being able to uh, you know uh, um, do a do a do a continuous uh, or a ceaseless uh, work of landscape where the uh, surrounding and the design in 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 totality togetherness is what uh, um, determines the experiential realm so these are some ways and in fact sometimes when there is uh, nothing more to look at then reflecting the sky is the way, is, is is one of the ways to uh, really go back and uh, have a have a journey into the surroundings so uh, sometimes in the urban uh, settings and uh, finding creative ways to frame uh, certain phenomena sometimes philosophically sometimes uh, playing a, you know a, uh, and 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 also uh, uh, determining the language of uh, landscape design as something that changes within the way that the surroundings also read so uh, these are all issues related to how we carry on this dialogue continuously in our mind with the settings in which we create the uh, next theme i would uh, illustrate is uh, that of landscape being a traverse landscape being a journey which reveals things which talks about an experience of moving from a point to another and exploring what lies between so motion or journey which is a very important idea in landscape so how we uh, look at these uh, traverses and uh, create different emotions or experiences as one uh, uses a traverse to pass from a, uh, to, to 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 get landscape experience within uh, large complexes so uh, the, here are various ways in which we've tried to integrate uh, uh, the meaning of uh, journey in landscape of course the mode of travel is also something which is very important to understand the speed at which one would uh, reveal and understand landscape uh, another very favorite theme of ours is uh, to reimagine cultural aesthetic evoke history through design and celebrate our rootedness of course by looking at what is the soul of cultural thought that that is embedded in our tradition and then reinterpreting it in a fresh ephemeral body that would also change with time so uh, here are a few projects that illustrate this kind of uh, an approach to bring about period landscape or sometimes create rootedness in a very contemporary situation uh, just to uh, remind one of uh, of of the roots there are a lot of these a uh, lot of these uh, images of cultural landscape that are very peculiar to india and they have a certain meaning whether it is ghats or kunds or baulis or uh, so many other uh, archetypes that have been explored time and again uh, and these can these can really acquire new meanings in designed landscape today the other uh, narrative that i uh, thought is worthy of mention is about 
stylizing the natural processes and patterns themselves because these are because we are we are we are, we are our tool of design is nature so how could we steps how could we bring in nature in a stylized form into uh, the landscape geometry and determine the order of uh, organization in landscape based on uh, how we perceive order in nature so various ways to represent let's say the journey of a river a delta uh, various ways to look at uh, how um, the flow in landscape um, goes through so many experiences ideas about uh, depiction of topography ideas about looking at land water and vegetation as a contiguous flow that is captured in a geometrical basis and also um, direct uh, uh, inspiration from uh, natural material to create uh, various uh, landscape uh, icons sculptures and uh, um, such other elements to organize landscape space then uh, another important thing that we need to understand is that land in itself is something which is the primary point in landscape so landscape design is not about uh, creating a movement system and then sprinkling activity along it it is about first creating the landscape out of land itself it is about modulating land to create experiences and this becomes a very important theme uh, especially when uh, we look at the design of uh, parks and larger open spaces landscape also as i said is a discipline within or it constitutes disciplines within discipline so sometimes these disciplinary bounds need to be blurred one doesn't realize where indoors begin and outdoors end or one doesn't realize where architecture and landscape merge into each other what kind of a detailed coordination between various disciplines is required to have uh, or to achieve a space that uh, is is uh, so to say monolithic in terms of uh, the way uh, each discipline meshes into the other or even in indoor outdoor continuums then we talk about thematic urbanism where uh, the idea is to bring about a character in a particular urban zone based on uh, the brief at hand and an opportunity to uh, define public realm where uh, uh, where uh, there is an idea that is to be uh, to be to, an idea that is ingrained and to be uh, brought out through design also a uh, lot of our work happens in gated enclaves so of course aspirational luxury is something that again uh, landscape is capable of evoking and uh, these are some of the works which talk about how uh, natural elements can be stylized to become images of uh, luxury then the idea of landscape as a metaphor and sometimes the etymology of uh, development also generating clues to design so how how does that work and these are a certain landscape orders and uh, uh, images where uh, the metaphor has been very very important in uh, crafting this design uh, so here are representations of uh, um, cultivation of canals of foothills of uh, uh, so many other things that you see in these images and then um, how landscape sometimes can aid as a, or aid the brief and i would call it the other way I, i would call it a performance landscape not in the way that we understand it typically but how for example in a school a simple space like an amphitheater could be a, a place where one could learn trigonometry you know how we could aid the brief in going one step forward so uh, these were some of the ideas that i wanted to bring about in today's discussion and i end with this uh, famous quote of uh, from landscape of man which says that the world is moving into a phase when landscape design may well be recognized as the most comprehensive of the arts man creates around him an environment that is a projection into nature of his abstract ideas thank you so much well uh, thank you so much sir uh, 
really deep and uh, experience best presentation i must say and uh, it was really great to see all the theme works that you've presented so uh, i hope uh, this has been a great learning experience for all the young uh, like from my generation people who have joined it has been a really an extensive work